everybody looks like we are alive how are you guys doing today uh so glad to see you uh looks like we only have two people but two of the very best people we have brad from manitoba and we have mr roy from new jersey it's really ironic as uh as the content becomes more valuable the people kind of trickle away. I don't know, but it's kind of ironic. So today we will be going over color for the first time. Hey, Raul, how you doing all the way from Jersey? We got Chris all the way from New York State. How are you, sir? And Mr. Steve Leahy, how's it going? Good to see you all. So, so glad you guys are here. Uh, so today is the initial layers of color my very own way of actually using color. So, uh, you know, over the years, came up with my own method and, uh, you know, I was first every other medium uh, in color before I even touched an airbrush. So color isn't new to me at any rate, but what I find exciting is how I can apply the knowledge from other mediums into this which is very exciting so I'd be happy I'm going to be happy to share that with you all and so let's see how that goes so as you can see in this window right here I have my uh, my oil painting palette so you say well Tim are you going to go ahead and put oil paint on your uh, on your airbrush painting no but why would I go ahead and kind of mix liquidy and, you know, try and find the color when I could find it much better using insoluble paints as opposed to soluble paints? It's much easier to adjust with soluble paints than unsoluble paints. Hey, how you doing, honey, all the way from Long Island? So let me explain the difference between soluble and unsoluble uh, paints. Just like when you have fiber, you have insoluble fiber and you have fiber insoluble means that you poop it out insoluble means that the walls of your stomach and your lower and upper intestines uh smaller intestines kind of absorb it so it's soluble so the same thing with paint when you have my india inks it's a type of uh soluble because whatever color that's in here, in this case carbon, it actually becomes part of the liquid and doesn't separate, right? So when you have, let's say, you know, this color by Golden Fluid Acrylics, it is a combination of the two, but for all intents and purposes, in its state, it's in a soluble form. But really it isn't. So this is... This would be soluble because when it dries, it becomes, it's not, it's not part of the water or the medium, the acrylic medium, because eventually it will separate. Now, when you go to things that are called dyes, uh, candies, or, or um, something like a urethane well not so much urethane but with candies or watercolor that is soluble so when i'm going to be mixing my colors i'm going to be doing that on my regular traditional palette because i can find that color much faster and very quickly find the ratios i need to get my intended color hey oz how you doing all the way from the atlanta area good to see you so it's only rational for me to go ahead and use that knowledge to go ahead and and get quicker with my mixing as well as more accurate right so what i'm going to do first is talk about how i'm going to test things out on the same surface right so this is a marble dust and gesso treated board uh, it's a hard board and I have a smaller version. With this smaller version, I could go ahead and test and see what that color is going to look like before I put it on there. I don't want to be oops. And I have to make sure that I'm doing it on the same surface because it's going to look 
so different than everything else, right? It's just going to look so different uh, if I test it on, let's say, my color line paper by Canson or Canvas. So I have the same exact treated board. That's going to make all the difference. So keep that in mind of what I'm doing. So I'll be using a combination of golden fluid acrylics, high flow acrylics over an underpainting I did last week, which is with India ink and airbrush. I will be working in airbrush again. So I'm not going to go ahead and get too detailed with my airbrush underpainting. Uh, I'm going to keep it on the undetailed side. And so what I'm going to do is first I'm going to look for the local color of her flesh. Now if we look at the flesh on her, right, let's make it bigger. We can see that there's this super light area, but basically the average of the dark light and the light light, that's pretty much what I'm going to shoot for. Probably what you see on the upper plane of the forehead or the front the frontal bone here that's where i'm going to shoot and i'm going to basically spray this whole area with that color and just build up and go from light to dark using semi-opaque colors at first and then eventually going fully opaque as time goes on so that's my my whole spiel okay and let's see very cool and let's see here all right so let's see if i missed anybody i apologize but everyone who is here thank you so much and brad says great underpainting much appreciated sir okay so first things first let me see if i can darken her just a tad and now i'm going to be looking for that color but watch as i look for that color with a palette knife and um, I'm actually going to get this color, which is transparent red iron oxide. Transparent red iron oxide is the same exact pigment that is used for burnt sienna. Same pigment used for caput mortem, for uh, violet, red violet oxide. But there's a different process to take that same pigment and make it into a different shade or different qualities, whether it be opaque or transparent so uh, as you can see here I'm going to be let me make this big because there's no reason for the other stuff to be big so I'm going to take some of this red iron oxide here and I like the color Naples yellow so I'm going to add a little Naples yellow to this and we're just going to mix that up and I want to get that color that I talked about, that average color. So what I'll do is I'm going to say that's too dark, right? So I'm going to adjust it so I want to make it light. There's two ways to make it light. You can make it light with color or you can make it lighter with white or you can make it lighter by adding more medium, but you don't really have that kind of wiggle room that you normally do because when you dilute acrylics you start losing adhesion and all that fun stuff that comes with that but I'm going to lighten this up with more of this Naples yellow and you can see I'm getting really close and the red transparent red iron oxide is actually very close now I could actually get away with using burnt sienna with this right so right now, if we look, we can say, let me move this down here. Right now, we can see that we have a pretty nice color. Maybe we can go just a tad lighter. So we're going to add a little more of that Naples yellow. Now, Naples yellow is an opaque color. But... All rules are meant to be broken eventually and so whoop blocking it 
there we go so you can see just kind of seeing how that color is and that looks pretty good as my average color and I just used two colors so why do you want to use the least amount of colors then uh, then let's say I use four colors to get there could anyone tell me why it would be bad to use four colors to get there or that whole saying where I only use three colors in black or whatever because when you're using fewer colors right out of the tube to get what you want you're gonna have more vibrancy because uh, because that is that is just color theory because every color is going to is going to cancel out another color uh, to some extent so having four colors or five colors what you're going to do is you're going to lower your saturation and you're going to have pretty dull colors so we'll get that and we'll see if we can mix it by what I did in oil paints so the first color that we're going to use is Naples yellow hue now why is it Naples yellow hue because they found out well they knew for a long time but now Naples yellow used to be called tin yellow because it was made with lead and even though there's very little lead in Naples yellow the health officials said nope we we're gonna outlaw it so pretty soon actual Naples yellow is no longer going to be available which is sad got to go on the black market to get those colors you want it's pretty funny uh, so I'm gonna take so remember it was more Naples yellow now that's really thick so before I do anything else I'm gonna dilute that with uh, airbrush medium by golden So here is the airbrush medium. So just like when you're making a smoothie, you want to go ahead and mix them individually rather than the whole thing together. Thin them out individually rather than the whole thing together. Am I right? So that makes a lot more sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shake up my airbrush medium. And we're going to thin that out really well and I'm going to take the back of a paintbrush and I'm going to mix that really well not mixing all that well but we'll keep at it so we want to get it to the consistency that will shoot through your airbrush right And I know Steve loves this, that I'm mixing over my painting, right, sir? I know you enjoy this part. <laughs> McDonald's told Steve that the coffee was hot right out of the cup. So now I have a semi, I don't want to be total, but now I have a nice mixture of my naples yellow hue right so what was the next color it was chartreuse no the next color was transparent red iron oxide so we're going to look for that together and i have mucho paint i have red iron oxide i have violet oxide and it's just going to be a few moments before i find it I can transparent brown iron oxide. I do have it, but I can use an alternative. And that alternative would be burnt sienna. Very close anyway. Okay, so looks like burnt sienna it is. Very close. And we're going to do this with caution. What's the shelf life of the paint you're using? Oh man, 
I would say a good five, six years. Uh, and then you can still save it by thinning it out. So you see the uh, brown iron oxide is a little, po uh, little powerful. So I'm going to, actually this is burnt sienna. Is it? Yeah, burnt sienna. So what I want to do is I eventually want to get to that color that I have. So it's still a little on the yellow side. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and mix some more in. But you know what's really cool is I have my target. I'm not hoping it's going to come out okay. You know, I, I know what the mixture will be. And you don't want to be exact. You don't have to be exact, right? You really don't. But I can put a little more of that that uh, burnt sienna in there. And that's also used with PR101. When you're looking at pigments, when you see PR, PLO, P, I mean PY, PB, uh, PB is not peanut butter, but that's pigment blue, pigment yellow, or pigment red. So... PR101 is a synthetic earth color and uh, and it's a red so that's basically so it's a specific pigment that the paint companies have to actually purchase so now I'm going to take my pigment and I'm gonna look and I'm gonna say this is a little bit on the yellow side right because this looks like a little more fleshy but it's pretty close so I'm gonna go with it and so what I did was at first I thinned it out with airbrush medium so the chemist at Golden told me that what I can do at this point is I can start thinning it out with the high flow medium And let's see if I could put some of that in there to get the desired effect. Let's see if I have it over here. Put some of this in there. And you can see I'm thinning it out to the consistency I want. Now we also have the ability to thin this out up to about 10% water. Which is very cool, so it gives you even more, more wiggle room to thin this out the way you like. So this is my, and now it has a very thin consistency. It's thicker than my inks, but it definitely is a really nice consistency so okay so I have a nice amount here now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this airbrush right here which is my Omni for is it the Omni 4000 I like it it's a cool airbrush and let's go ahead and make this happen and this is our initial layers of color. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and we're going to test out the color on this first, right? Very important. And couldn't you have added the airbrush medium to what you mixed on the palette to thin it out since you had the color you wanted? Very true, but the thing is these are oil paints. So although I could shoot oil paints through the, through the uh, airbrush, it's quite poisonous. It would be deadly. 
So that's why I didn't. I could also set up this and use it as, you know, use acrylics. But that's a good point, honey. Thank you. And Brad said, uh, but what could go wrong? <laughs> Mixing painting over, painting over the work, right? Brad says, don't eat the large white mints. <laughs> and let's see. Okay. So I'm going to test my airbrush. And now I'm going to spray this. We're going to see how bad or good it looks. And that's a really nice, as you can see, that's a really nice basic flesh color to start with. Now, I took a long time, and you might say, Tim, why are you taking a long time? Because it's easier to take your time and, and be as thorough as possible than, you know, going in and having to fix it, you know? All right, so let's go ahead and start our initial layers but maybe we could do some housekeeping and get rid of some now when you work with my airbrush india inks you have a great advantage of getting rid of the pencil lines at, at any time but when you're working with acrylic you don't whether you're working with uh createx or or uh, any other medium in airbrush paint, it doesn't matter. You're going to have pencil lines trapped under the acrylic. So you want to do housekeeping before, so you don't have to fix that pencil line. Okay, here goes. Dun, dun, dun. Let's see if we could zoom in. And we'll start with the frontal bone. Notice I won't be calling them too much by the uh, civilian names, you know. So let's go ahead and make this happen. All right. So now I'm going to be about four inches away. And there's my initial layers of color. Now the underpainting is going to help me down the line more so than now as to where to put. Where to do the details and the features. But right now, I'm actually going over the lips as well. And I can see it's a little bit on the yellow side. But am I worried? No, I'll just do another layer. And I'll just add more of the burnt sienna. Maybe just a touch of, um, of a red. Now, all reds are not created equal. So the red I may use for this would probably be... Uh, maybe something like a naphthol red or, or something like that. So why would I paint the lips? Because the lip color is basically uh, made with flesh color. Because it's part of your skin and everything like that, so it's the same. And so you can see very light, very transparent. So you say, Tim, how could you do transparent when you obviously mix an opaque color like the uh, Naples Yellow Hue? Well, anything thinned out can become a transparent, especially an airbrush. I'm even going to paint in her ears. I'm going to take this same color because you want continuity. You don't want to uh, have the hand a whole different mixture than her face. So you want to have that continuity. So I'm definitely going to come in here.
And like I said, it is a little bit on the yellow side, but that's easily rectified with our next layer. There we go. So now we can definitely decide that our next layer, we want to be a little more on the red side, right? So, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take this very mixture and I'm going to add just the slightest bit. But here's a trick. So I don't want to go ahead and put too much red in here and then I'll be sorry. And now I'm, I don't have my original mixture. So I'm going to take about half of it put it in there like that right and then I could afford to thin it out a little bit more now I'm going to add a little bit of red so I'm going to look for a nice uh, kind of chill red here that would help us Here is a naphthol red light that I talked about earlier, and I'm going to try, I'm going to attempt to put in one drop, which I put in a lot more than one drop, as you can see. So it might dominate this, and I see, see how like I accidentally uh, put in too much? Now I'm, I'm not destroyed, right? Because... Now I can just take a little tiny bit. And here's a trick that I do is I would take a, a Q-tip and I will just grab this Q-tip and then I'll just assimilate as much as that red a little bit at a time that I want. So it's really important that I was able to go ahead and gradually make that that change so I get it as red as I want. So now we're getting a much more of a red color. Let's see. Okay, so it's definitely much more red than it was before. Maybe I'm going to put a little more red because I want to compensate for the overly yellow here. All right. So I'm going to take my airbrush and kind of clean it out. Kind of clean it out. I am going to clean it out. Spray some water through it. I don't want the yellowish color to go ahead and uh, contaminate. So I'm going to take some of this color and see if it's a big difference than what I had. Still want to keep my original over there and again I have this piece of wood that's prepared exactly in the same way wow see how much more red that is now so I'm happy with that change now what I'm going to do is Do another layer. And now I'm getting much closer to that color. And I'm also evening out her skin tone. I'd say I'm about six inches from the subject. From the surface. And I thinned them out significantly. So I'm not getting too much tip dry, hardly any at all. But you can see how my underpainting is really helping out 
my cause here. And now we're going to take that same reddish color and we're going to apply that to her cute hand here. Now I can, as I'm going, go ahead and do housekeeping. So here we have a pencil line. We still have time after the initial layer to get rid of some of these crazy pencil lines that really are going to do nothing but give us a headache when we get further down the line. Nice, beautiful. See how we're getting nicer, a nicer flesh tone now. But I'm arriving at the color. I'm not one of those artists who are going to continue going until I get that exact mixture. No, I'm going to arrive at the color. But I'm going to be scientific about what color I apply. But my goal is not to have that color initially. Okay, so now I'm pretty happy about that. The beauty of working in airbrush acrylics, whether it be Createx or, you know, one of the many airbrush colors or golden acrylics, is that it applies almost instantaneously. To those who are oil painters, that's really annoying. Those who love acrylics, that's really great. I like things to be open and stay open so I can move it around and kind of be more sculptural with color. But an airbrush, you kind of have to, uh, you kind of have to think on your feet, you know. It's like the man with two brains, the movie with Steve Martin. He was in Austria and he had to do the, the, uh, the DWI test and he had to juggle on one foot while singing a German song, uh, it was hilarious. And he goes, wow, your DWI tests are really tough in Europe. That's sort of like painting in acrylic in color because you're dealing with this, this fast drying stuff. You're like, oh my God, you know, it's really rough. But there are some really good aspects about it as well. Having it dry fast, I don't have to wait till tomorrow to go ahead and change up, right? So one of the things I like to do, these cups are great. You can get them from Amazon. They're about $3.50 for 50 of them. And I like to get these because we can do this. Let me get the cups. Okay, they come with the tops so you can cover them and I like this red because this, you know, remember I overshot that red? I can immediately go into her lips right now and, but that's like super pink. So what I'm going to do is I am going to, uh, before I go in with the lips, let's go ahead and work on this mid-tone here. So I'm going to paint this mid-tone value. And again, I'm going to come over to my oil painting palette. And I'm going to ask myself, self, how do I mix the mid-tone, right? I don't want to draw dark to the board. Hope I get it and spray it. I want to get close to where I want to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and find my base tone. So my base tone is going to be that transparent red iron oxide that we all know and love. And I'm going to mix a smaller amount of our Naples yellow hue. And we're going to start out with a nice darker color. And you can see almost immediately we're getting really close. It happens sometimes, not always. So it might be a little bit on the on the uh, red iron oxide color, right? But maybe a little too far over there. So I like taking this little guy right here. 
and I look for my color and we're probably right around here I would say right around here so what would be the complement so it would be a blue right so I want to calm this down a little bit but first I'm going to mix it but let's see what happens if I calm it down with the oil paints so I'm going to take a uh, cobalt blue and I'm going to put the tiniest amount of cobalt blue There are all kinds of blues, cobalt blue, Prussian blue, uh, ultramarine, which is the most common. And those colors, they have individual pigments. So it's not like a designer color. It is a color that comes up from a particular pigment. And the more that a color is uh, hard to get, those pigments are hard to get, that's the more expensive the color is that's why you got series one two three four five so again so i'm happy with that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take a fresh cup and we're going to mix more of our burnt sienna we don't have red iron oxide but this is transparent red iron oxide it's much it's very close made with the same pigment so if it's made with PR101, it has the same DNA. So a lot of times you can get to that another pigment made with PR101. So remember, we're going to use just a little bit of that Naples yellow hue. But I just got an epiphany. So what I'm going to do is I want to mix a little bit of raw sienna to it. I think raw sienna is a little more ruddy, and I think that would help us more. So I'm going to look for raw sienna. So here I have some raw sienna as you can see and I'm going to put just a tad of raw sienna in here. Let's see. My raw sienna seems to be unavailable, so I'm going to mix just a tad of uh, yellow ochre. They're very close colors. The yellow ochre is a little less of a ruddy color. It's more yellowy. I'm going to put just a little bit of that in there. And now we're going to take some of our airbrush medium. And with golden, the airbrush medium will take the fluid acrylics and basically make it a lot more in the consistency of airbrush colors. But if you want to take that even thinner and you like working thin like I do, then you would go further and use the, the airbrush, the, uh, the high flow medium. That would be the better route because you're taking it and you're thinning it even more, but you're not ruining the adhesion quality of the paint. And I'm just looking for that bottle. Hmm. Be right with you guys, just looking for that bottle. Here it is. And we're going to thin this out even further. Now that's very close to the color I like, right? I'm actually happy with it. But remember we wanted to add a little bit of that blue because it's a little on the burnt sienna side, right? I want to kill that just a little bit. So, paper towels are really important when you're working in color. So, buy a small paper towel business and you'll be just fine. 
Again, I want to add just the slightest little bit of cerulean blue, right? I wouldn't do it with uh, another blue, like let's say ultramarine or something like that. So you have to So basically, you have to make sure that you are being very, very gentle in the amount of blue and which blue. Because I, like I said, all blues aren't created equal. So I'm going to be looking for a cobalt blue or something very similar to it. Now your primary cyan is very similar to cobalt blue, so that's fine. See that I mixed up some cobalt blue, but I'm going to put it in a separate. Oh, I have a question. Honey says, "Will the airbrush medium cause it to set that you have to use it quickly?" No. The great thing about the airbrush medium, honey, is that it lets the paint adhere. Uh, if you ever over diluted uh, an acrylic paint, whether it be airbrush colors or otherwise, you'll see that the pigment separates and then it has nothing to grab on hold, grab hold to and it just kind of wipes off. So that's uh, one of the things you want to worry about when you're diluting color. Okay, so here is my cerulean blue, which is primary blue. So there is science involved in color mixing. And I'm going to be very gentle. Just so I shift it. Because I don't want to ruin this beautiful color I made with burnt sienna and burnt sienna and yellow ochre. See that now it's nice and dull, but not too dull, and I like that. So now I'm going to take this and I'm going to add a little more of my high flow medium and then a tad bit of water. I like it thin because, of course, I paint India inks, don't I? Right? So, uh, but you can't dilute more than 10%. And um, that's something that I listen to with Golden because um, I, don't, I don't want my paint not to adhere. Okay, so I have my, my color. I'm going to use the same airbrush, which is the Omni 4000. And let me flush out some of that old color. And again, I'm going to test this out and see if I need to adjust it. How's the sound and picture, by the way? Okay, guys? Okay. All right, so here we go. We're ret go. Just going to put a little bit in. And here's our guinea pig paddle. Okay, we have some water stuck in there. Okay, beautiful dark transparent mid-tone, right? Or transition tone. So, feeling good about that. Oh, thanks, Steve. Steve says, sounds and looks great. I appreciate that, sir. The only thing is, when working in color, you're inundated with all these different colors and, and bottles and everything. So working in Airbrush India ink is relaxing. All right, so I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to start hitting my mid-tones. Now we're going to start modeling her forms and go from there. And even by dulling that color, you can still see it's very saturated. But this is something we're going to work on later.
And the same thing I'm worrying about things like the obicularisaurus and the, the fat compartments and all that fun stuff. And you see, I'm, I'm hitting this, going right into the dark with this kind of transition tone. Because when I come into the dark, I want it to be very, very blended. Let the airbrush do the, all the hard work, right? We don't have to worry about doing the hard work. Let the airbrush do it. So you want to go in with this mid-tone into your dark. going to put a tiny bit of this mid-tone color into the lips because the lips are skin right with more blood visible because the skin is thinner and so let's work into the shadow plane over here it's going to go right in there we're going to have that dark color go over the light color or the mid-tone Now notice I'm not just doing a monochromatic underpainting, right? I'm not I'm doing a color underpainting using monochromatic. You can see I'm using different pigments. Now I'm starting to paint. I'm not underpainting at this point. And that goes with my knowledge of painting from studying oil painting and watercolor and pastel, right? So I don't at this point... Uh, go ahead and work monochromatically although it may appear that because the colors are very close to one another okay so now let's work on the mid-tones of her hands and don't worry about the hand the mid-tone going into the, the jacket that's not a concern if the adjacent color is darker, no worries. If the adjacent color is lighter, definitely be careful. I'm more concerned with the values and things like that. Let's see if I can do a little housekeeping over here. Actually, maybe we should get a little more aggressive here. Yeah, so the, the, the dangers of acrylic is that it's not India ink. So you do have to be more careful. It's, not, it's no big deal. You just have to... You just have to be more mindful of that particular quality. I love working in airbrush acrylics. It's a lot of fun. Okay, so you see we have our values right here. We have you know our darker value right here we have a really light value and then the value we fix over here so we can see we have everything here so i'm going to spray some of this right over here so when i go into my next step i'll have more of an idea of what i want to do right so what i'm going to do right now is i'm going to buffer that color a little bit and that's interesting. So it's, uh, this is going to be totally different. So I'm going to create kind of a blue shift on purpose. And you're going to be like, Tim, you're crazy. And I'm like, tell me something I don't know. But we're going to test it on there first. So I'm going to get rid of 
all the color that's in my airbrush right now. And I'm going to wipe the cup because I'm coming in with a lighter color, right? So that darker color will definitely contaminate what I want to do. Now remember I said that all reds aren't created equal. Same thing, all whites aren't created equal. So rather than using titanium white, I'm going to use zinc white. So why zinc white? What do you think the reason is I want to use zinc white? The thing is, zinc white is a much more transparent white than titanium. And it also has less blue in it. So those are two qualities that I'm looking for when working with this. So I'm going to take that, my white here, and now I'm going to go ahead and uh, dilute this son of a gun. Let's see. First we'll dilute it with the airbrush medium. And we may dilute this much further than the other color. And then once we have the airbrush medium, we'll dilute it some more with the high flow medium. And then we'll take the same paintbrush. I'm going to add a real baby amount of, but before I do that, let's see what this does before because I may not need to worry about this. There may not be a blue shift, right? I know that's kind of crazy. And what are you going to do? So I'm going to put a tiny bit of that in my airbrush. And I'm going to, nope, I'm not going to test it there. We're going to test it here. So let's see what this does. Oh. I spilled a little bit of my zinc white on the rug, but it's so transparent that it is not as bad as I initially thought. So, but let's see how this looks. So it is it's a little on the thin side, so I'm going to add more of the zinc white. Sometimes you can get too thin, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't adhere. And Steve talks about that on his live streams, how it doesn't adhere at times. And he gives great information on that. So now I have a thicker version of this. So it does shift it a little tiny bit, but I'm not too worried. Let's see. Let's see what happens. So we'll try it on her forehead. Let me put the cap on here. Because zinc white is a very transparent white, so it's and it has less blue in it. So let's see how this goes. And that seems to be lightening my values and kind of getting rid of that insoluble paint look. So actually, it's working. I'm not getting any blue shift because there's hardly any blue in zinc white and I have it diluted a lot. 
and now it's doing exactly what I want to do. It's it's actually getting rid of that stained look, you know, that insoluble look. Hey, what's up, JC? Great to see you. How are you? So glad you're here. And uh, <laughs> he says, I'm crazy. I understand. I agree. Definitely. Good to see you, JC. How have you been? Notice how now if I lighten this and I can go back with the darker transparency and I can continue to do this until it doesn't allow me anymore. And now it's starting to look more as if I would put my initial layers of oil paints. So I'm very happy with this. Now it it's because I went ahead and had the same exact surface and I tested it out here than say, oh my God, I hope it works out. No, I don't want to do I hope it works out. That's too scary, uh, especially when you're live streaming, right? So I'm going to cover my paints because I do learn lessons. Isn't that cerulean blue really great? Well, primary blue is very similar to cerulean blue. I'm going to cover these so if it does fall it's not a disaster and let me uh, clean up just a little bit more so we are at 1038 we went through uh hey Braden, how you doing great to see you how are you sir all the way from edmonton and so that is so cool and so honey says just curious is the oil painting mixing sacrificial uh now i'm not quite sure about that might be spell check so what do you mean about the sacrificial part and so so glad and jc where are you from what state may i ask so really very happy with how it's looking right now so I'm going to concentrate on her skin today. So that's what we're going to do. So now let's mix the dark color. In oils, I love the darks. I love, love, love the darks. And because it's sort of the anchor, right? So this dark here, I'm going to do it on my palette first, right? Because it's just the language I speak with color. So... I'm going to find this really cool color, which is violet or red iron oxide. Actually, let me show you it, the color, show you the color. I'm going to show you two colors that are very similar in airbrush colors and in, so here's the airbrush colors, and this is called violet oxide. That's a synthetic version of this, which is called caput mortem, which means uh, useless remains. Funny thing about caput mortem is that it used to be made out of mummies. Yes, mummies. And uh, so back in the 1700s, early 1800s, there were so many people grabbing the mummies from Egypt and there were no laws to stop them that there was this surplus of mummies. So what the pigment manufacturers would do is they would grind up the mummies to make what is called mummy brown. And mummy brown turned into caput mortem. Now it's a historic color, but what happened was people started running out of mummies and also artists were like, that's gross. I don't want to paint with dead people, especially ones I don't know. And so it kind of died out a little bit, but it's still around. But Caput Mortem is a very important color when you are using for the darks in flesh. So I use Caput Mortem. It's a main color on my oil painting uh, palette, but Violet Oxide is very close. So this is a synthetic version of it. 
So I'm going to basically replace this when I'm mixing it for my painting. And there we go. So now I'm just going to take some of my Caput Mortem. It also means deadhead. So, and also Caput Mortem back in the day, uh, you would get all different colors depending on what part of the dead person you use to mix that color. I love that stuff, you know? I love when you get into color and you can go as deep as you want. So I'm gonna take some of my Caput Mortem, which is a perfect color for this. And then I'm going to mix in some of my flesh color, right, that we mixed earlier. And we're gonna mix that together. So remember the last time we used uh, yellow ochre and some of our transparent uh, iron oxide, but also uh, remember that when we did this, um, we use a little bit of the yellow ochre. So we'll bring in the yellow ochre again because that's going to get rid of the violet in that dark, right? So we're just going to mix it. And I want to get pretty dark, but it's not super dark in, in the shadows with her. There's really no super darks. But let's take a look and see where we are. That's pretty close, right, to what I want. So I have an idea of what I want. This is my process. It's not something that, you know, I think that people should adhere to. What I'm really saying is that we all should look for our method of mixing color. You know, what's going to be, what works for you, right? So let me go back in with this white and just calm down some of these staining qualities of the transparent. Remember, insoluble paints tend to stain and, I mean, soluble paints tend to stain like watercolor and insoluble tend to cover. So, uh, so I'm just going to calm that down. And notice how much better that looks right there. Okay. So we're going to take our violet oxide. We're going to shake that up. Now, I haven't worked in color with airbrush in a long time regularly. So a lot of these paints are pretty thick. So I have to dilute them a little bit more than I normally would. Okay, so there it is. Red iron oxide, very close to Caput Mortem. I like getting scientific with color in a big way. So we're going to add a little bit of our yellow ochre. What that's going to do is going to get rid of that violet aspect of that color. And now we're going to come back with the burnt sienna. Now notice I use very traditional historical colors. Uh, that's just my upbringing artistically. You don't have to do that. I'm not sitting here saying you have to do it that way. That would be, you know, that would be pompous. And that's not true. Work whatever colors, whatever brand, if you love Createx. Go to town with Createx. Steve Leahy does amazing thing with Createx. He's, an, he's incredible. So does Chris and a lot of you all out there. You just kick butt with this uh, Createx. And they do great things. And um, proof's in the pudding, right? Look at your work. Look at your guys' work. Proof is definitely in the pudding. So it's a very violet world right here. I don't like it. So I'm going to add a little more of my yellow ochre in there. And working in, working in color is messy. And I'm not a messy artist. I like being very neat. So you see as I came in with that color. Now I want to kind of kill the chroma a little bit. Now there are different ways. I could go ahead and do that by using the complementary but I want to show you another way which is really cool 
And that way is using the color raw umber. Raw umber is a really great color for killing the chroma or the saturation of the color. So I am looking for raw umber. If you were rare or umber, where would you be? Let's see. We have sepia, we have shading gray, we have Van Dyke Brown, which I love. So, just, I love Van Dyke Brown. It's just an amazing color. Can't live without it. Here it is, it was behind something. And this is raw umber. So you see it's a semi uh, opaque color, but it really deadens things. Let's let's deaden it a little bit. Okay. And we're gonna mix this up. So it's still really chromatic, and I don't like it so chromatic. So I would have to put in a whole lot of raw umber to go ahead and deaden that. But that's not what you want to do because before you know it, you have a gallon of paint and you don't have the color you want. So when it gets to that point, I just go ahead and take a little bit of that and then adjust it. Get a lot of these cups. You're going to be using a lot of them. Trust me. And then when you have a gift card that's active, don't leave it in your paint area. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of this and I'm going to put it here. Just a little bit. And now I can dilute it with airbrush medium. and a little bit of the high flow medium. So now I have that, I have a color here. It's, it's really diluted and I kind of like that. So let's put a little bit of that raw umber in there because it just does the right amount of desaturation for me. Whatever works for you guys is great. If I can inspire just a little bit, then I feel good. Now, I'm a little weary that I might have over overdid it, but let's add a little more of our original violet oxide because it looks a little too dead. Now, it looks very close to what I want. Let's dilute it just a little bit with water. We have that 10% leeway, right? Okay, nice. It doesn't feel like ink, but it doesn't feel like sour cream either. So I have my white here, and before I go ahead, I'm just going to deaden some of this staining quality of this color here. Okay, let's get rid of this. Empty out the white. Remember, I use zinc white, which is a whole different ball game than titanium white you get from most paint companies. It's a different ball game. Okay, so let's shoot some water through here. So this is the first time I'm actually showing my method of doing color and airbrush. So it is a little, a little out there, but it's just my way. But if you like the traditional way of painting, then this is definitely something that you might really love. So let's put a little bit of that in there. And we're going to leave it so I might have to darken it so let's check it out oh great honey says she's learning a lot that is fantastic oh so Steve what happened on Facebook did you get a uh, 
any kind of milestone on Facebook, Steve? So that's interesting. Mr. Todd, how are you? Great to see you. Oh, honey, that's funny. So instead of the mummies, they didn't want the daddies. No, not as good. Definitely not. I'm going to lower the air pressure a little bit here. Remember, I don't, I don't throw darts at boards. I'm going to see if it works before I do it. This is the board. And I'm going to see. It, it looks like it needs a little more paint because it looks like I diluted it too much. See what happens when you dilute it a little too much? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of my original mixture. That's nice and thick. And you'll know, you're like, uh-oh, I went crazy with the dilution. Okay. Yeah, see how you're getting a little bit better? I'm going to have to lower the air pressure a little bit and keep this super transparent. So I'm going to lower the air pressure with the pack valve. And now you see I'm coming in with the dark now. I'm going to be far away because I want a very, uh, very translucent Hey, Rick, how's it going? Great to see you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So glad to see you all the way from uh, British Columbia, uh, Canada. Always, always love my Canadian friends. And now I'm... Um, darkening these, this value here. And notice how nice and transparent it is. And notice I'm still going from light to dark, right? I'm not, I'm not hitting my darkest dark yet. Just like the way I work in this aspect in India ink. I like going from light to dark. Pam, how are you all the way from Virginia? How's everything? How are you feeling? And how is work going? Oh, this violet oxide is really working well. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, knock that back later as well. So I'm always going to put a color in and I'm going to knock it back with that white. And so I'm actually forcing... I'm actually, it's funny because I'm forcing blue shift, which most artists will actually shy away from. It's a scary way of working, but I like it because you get a real opaque feel to your paint. So even at this point, when I put in this uh, violet oxide uh, combination, you can see that it has a very transparent feeling at this point. Oh, great. So I'm so glad everything is going good. That's great, Pam. And Mr. Todd, I don't know if I, if I said hello to Todd yet. How you doing from San Diego? There you are, sir. So cool. And now I have the ability to just... Make sure that I'm getting good flow. When you're working with thicker paints like this, you have to be careful of uh, things like clogging and tip dry. It's going to be a lot more prevalent. But I love this violet oxide. It really does the trick. And...
So yes, uh, Mr. Steve is a very hard worker and an inspiration in the airbrush field. Definitely, sir. Make sure I have enough. I'm good. I have enough paint in there. And... We'll put a little more paint in here. And now we can repeat here on the side of her face. And I have this nice kind of Kaput Mortem color and I'm just going to apply that to the lips again. Because like I said, the lips are our skin, just very thin and that's why they're so red. We're going to do the Glabella right here. And let's work on her arm. Oh, Rick said he's loving the color portrait. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Well, I have an amazingly beautiful model with Michella. And so I'm fortunate in that respect. Thank you, sir. Uh-oh, see we have a little bit of an accident here, but don't worry. So what we'll do is just go like that. So if an accident like this happens and it's in, uh, if it's at this stage and I'm watering it down a lot, you see that really didn't cause a problem. If that was on paper, I would have cried. I would have been weeping. It would have been so sad. You would have been like, wow, Tim's really sad. But I did have a little bit of a blowout. But that's normal. Okay. It's scary, but it's normal. Okay, let's go to her arm. And let's work on her arm here with this violet oxide color. And of course, I'm going to be knocking this color back later as well. Now I'm going to test it because that that color I had might not have been, uh, might not work with this darker color. So I may have to add a little bit of orange to it. That zinc white color that I was using. Okay, so starting to really do my initial layers of color, right? Now, I'm not going to do my darkest darks, but when I do the darkest darks, it's really going to lighten up my iron oxide, violet oxide color a lot. And that's going to be nice when that happens. But that was scary when I had that blowout, right? Oh my God. Okay, so right now we're, we're seeing that everything is like really super saturated. So we're gonna come in and we're gonna test out this on our test paper or test board. Remember, same exact same exact surface, same exact treatment of marble dust and gesso. So everything I do here, I'm going to get the same reaction over here, right? 
And Rick says, Tim, he saw your review of the Micron CMSB from 2017. Do you use it anymore? And if you recall, you recently said you didn't see the need for side feed guns. Great question. So everyone knows that back in the day I was an Iwata guy. I still love Iwata. I think they're do, doing great. It's just they're, I found another way, a uh, less expensive way. And someone on a budget like me needs a less expensive way. But yeah, I mean, I don't use them. I sold my, my microns and everything else. I basically sold them because I needed the money. It kind of hurt to sell them, but I did sell them. Now I'm a badger guy. I, you know, I make my own airbrush, the Extreme Patriot Arrow, and I sell it on my website. And my contention is that this airbrush gives you the same amount of detail that the Custom Micron, and it's a fraction of the cost. Now on the side feed, when you're working horizontal like I am, there's no need for the side feed. And I'll tell you why. And if you're working on a small level like I am, small panels, no bigger than 30 by 40, there's really no need for that. And so what happened with the side feed was several times when I was painting, and I paint a lot, sometimes 10 hours a day, and the cup would come off and it would really ruin my painting. Uh, and if I was able to fix it, it was a headache I didn't want. I didn't want that headache. I didn't sign up for that headache. So that happened a couple of times. And then for that to happen, because the more you do something, the better chance for something like that, a mishap is going to happen. I love the side feed because you have that beautiful unobstructed view. So there's side feeds are great. But for me, it wasn't worth, since I work horizontally, it wasn't worth the risk. So that's why I say the side feeds are not the best when you're working small. If you're working big, then the side feed can be advantageous. And if you're working vertical, then even if that cup falls and you accidentally kick it and it hits a cat, it doesn't affect your painting, so that's okay. But the poor cats, that's not good. We don't want it to hit the cat. So that's another reason. Don't get a side feed because you don't want to hit the cat. But seriously, you can see that, you know, you do just fine with the gravity feed. You get more paint out of it. And if you're working small, the gravity feed is definitely the way to go. I hope that helps, sir. Yes, definitely. So Brad says, if you believe in a product, you use it. Definitely. And if the pros outweigh the cons over another brand, and that's important. But I know a lot of you guys and girls out there... You like all kinds of brands, and that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. You work hard for your money, and you should have, you know, all the brands at your disposal. So, okay, so now we're going to, we're going to spray out this dark color. And we're going to go ahead, and we're going to do more of that color buffering on purpose. It's not really color buffering like Drew Blair's color buffering method. What I'm doing is, is I'm taking away the transparent quality of the colors by putting white over it. And uh, then it starts looking like pastel and oil paint. And that's my goal to have it look like that. I'm a pastel painter and oil painter. So that's my goal. I like the look. Someone who does something very similar to that would be Steve Gibson. He does that on purpose. Uh, Marissa Osterley will do it on purpose. When working in color, I don't like the way fully transparent looks. I don't like it. So that's why I do this. And, you know, I'm just very careful. Let's see how this goes. So it does blow it up a little bit. Blow it up a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix just the tiniest amount of orange. And I like pyrrole orange for this. 
So let me get some pyro orange. This is a scary thing doing this. So here we are, transparent pyro orange. Golden makes it so easy because it's a transparent and it's a pyro orange and that's exactly what I'm looking for. But I'm going to be a little bit different because if I put too much, then I'm going to orange up everything. And that's not good. You don't want to orange up everything. So I'm going to take a little bit of my Q-tip. And we're just going to change that color. I see Steve, Mr. Leahy do this a lot. He'll actually get you right into that cup. Very cool. All right. Now let's see if this does the trick. Gonna lower the air pressure. Get rid of the... Let's give this a try. So basically what I wanna do is just kill that look of the staining color. But notice I'm not getting any blue shift, which is very important. Now, as I'm doing this one layer, you know, every time I go ahead and repaint the flesh, I'm going to end up with a really nice, uh, I'm going to, this is really going to uh, give me a nice feel. So zinc white definitely does something different. Now everything looks very mid-tony and everything. I haven't even hit my lights, nor come in with my light, uh, hit my lights or my dark and dark. But what I'm going to do at this point. Now it's 11 o'clock, maybe I could start painting something else, but I'm really happy with this technique, you know, this is my very own technique, my own approach to this. Now back in 2018, I decided to just teach and work in black and white. And the reason why I did that, because I felt the art world really needed to see, the airbrush world needed to see value. And they weren't seeing value. And I mean value of the lights and darks, the dynamic range, that sort of thing. I'm going to come down to the hand. Notice how my skin tones are unified, right? Down the line, I could make it a little more red and change some variations, but if you look at the old masters, Caravaggio, Peter Paul Rubens, Angra, Jacques-Louis David, everything in their flesh is unified, meaning that they all come from the same DNA of colors. And maybe on camera you can't see what I'm doing, you know, see the reaction that this white is having over this color, but just know that it really is having an effect on it. Now, when I come in later, when I want more opacity, then I'm going to use the uh, titanium white because it's more opaque and it's going to have more of a covering. Right now we're kind of working in semi-transparence or semi-opaque depending on how you look at it. Okay, so that's not too bad and once again I am happy with, uh, with what we have here. Now, the thing with acrylic and the way that I use it, I'm very, uh, I work very much with the mediums and uh, the airbrush medium, the high flow. I work with fluid acrylics mostly. 
So I have to thin it out, and you're going to get sort of a, a tackiness to it. And I found that it's okay, you just have to let that dry, right? You, you got to let that set. So I'm not going to be doing too much on this. But as you can see, I have a, I'm pretty happy with the base that I have. And then I'm going to start coming in with the darks. And all these colors are really going to kind of fall into place a lot better. And let's see what I'm, oh, so Connie says she's looking good. Thank you. And, uh, and Chris says that the airbrush is a very personal tool. We all try multiple brands until we find the one that works for us. Also, different airbrushes for different projects. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And let's let's do a close-up and see how, how we're looking here. So definitely, this is how I would handle an oil painting. You know, and it's not a monochromatic... By any means you see I use at least six or seven colors in this already so definitely not monochromatic by any standards Rick says, uh, uh, I agree, Tim. I have your brush and just tried the CMSB. I prefer yours highly. Recommend everyone. Thank you so much, Rick. I appreciate that. Now, that is an unsolicited, uh, an unsolicited uh, uh, testimony, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to share that. Thank you so much, sir. That means a lot to me, and that's that's the true compliments are the ones that people have paid for your stuff and still say good things about it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, really cool. All right. So now we have this and let's see, what can we do? Let's paint her lips, okay? So her lips are this nice, interesting pink color. Uh, do we do that just yet? Oh, let's see if we can start coming in with some of those darks, right? So we're going to look for our darkest dark color. So I would say that that's going to be like Van Dyke Brown. So again, I'm going to come here. I'm going to take my Van Dyke Brown. Did I tell you I love Van Dyke Brown? I must have. Okay. I'm going to take a little bit of my Caput Mortem. I'm gonna... Now I could definitely just come in with black, but I might overdo it. I don't want to overdo it. So Van Dyke Brown and a little bit of that Caput Mortem. Because you want it dark, but you want to have the sense of, of flesh, right? Even in her mouth, it would be on the red side, not black, because of all the organic material, like, you know, all the blood that's underneath the surface on the roof of her mouth, her tongue, her cheeks. So I'm going to put a little bit more of my Caput Mortem there. And you see that nice kind of maybe a little bit more. So I'm going to take my dark here. Actually, I can always remix it. I'm not worried about getting the mixture again. So here I'm going to add some Van Dyke Brown to this, right? Because we're going to start working on some of the dark. And Van Dyke Brown, I've seen it. Did I leave it over there? Yes, I did. So that's sap green. And we Van Dyke Brown is right here. Okay. So um, I want more Van Dyke Brown than not. This is so messy compared to working in my airbrush into your inks. That's one of the draws to it. I just love not being messy. Okay, let me go wash my hands because I have Van Dyke Brown everywhere.
Okay, hands are clean. I'm going to get another cup. I'm going to take, actually, let's just put the Van Dyke brown right in there. And that's a little bit on the stiff side. Like I said, it has a long shelf life, but sometimes it gets pretty darn thick. So first thing we're going to do is put in the airbrush medium that is going to uh, come in here. We want to bring that Van Dyke Brown to airbrushable consistency. And you can see it's probably not as dark as I want it to be just yet. We don't want it too red. Let's throw caution to the wind and let's put a little bit of the bone black. I love bone black. Bone black is a little bit more organic than your lamp black, a little bit warmer. I mean, do I recommend, uh, you know, doing all this and, you know, using all these colors and trying to be more historical colors? If that would if that would blow your hair back, definitely. But if not, there's no need for this. But it kind of makes you feel like you're painting more like Caravaggio or Rembrandt because you're using similar colors that they had. Like I said, it's not crucial. Love bone black, and how it's made is in the title, right? And bone black is a little is a little more transparent no actually it looks like it's more opaque than lamp black and it's getting darker but i'm not sure i'm quite where i want to be yet but that's a beautiful dark isn't it but i think we could use something like this in the dark of her yeah let me see maybe we can uh, use this but I'm going to water it down a little bit more actually let's put in some high flow medium you can take the boy out of the academy but you can't take the academy out of the boy all right now kind of happy with that what did I have in here? I had the orangey mixture. Let's see how this goes. I may have to darken it up. We'll see. And I may have to thin it down. It might be a little too thick for the airbrush. Wow, honey, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. That means so much to me, and it helps so much. You just don't know how much you're helping, uh, you know, and I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much, honey. I appreciate and appreciate you attending and, and your wonderful comments all around. Thank you so much, uh, honey, and, uh, and thank you for all you're doing for the airbrush world, definitely. Okay. So now we're going to see how this works. This isn't India ink, so it's not going to flow like India ink. So I'm not 100% sure that it's going to do everything that I want it to do. But remember, we have this, right? So let's check this out. So I'm getting some weird weirdness here. not doing everything I wanted to do. So maybe the needle is uh, 
clogged a little bit you know maybe there's a little needle dry a uh, little tip dry here and I think that was the case and I'll just twirl that needle now it feels better let's see how that went guys I'm just not liking it so what it's telling me is that there's something stuck in the nozzle see I'm not getting the pattern that I want but let's go ahead and see how it goes And I'm using the earth cones because it's going to create more of a unified look. And I'm going to be coming in later, of course, with more specific colors. But kind of just giving everything the same DNA, right? And let's come over here on this side. paint in the iris right and as you can see by just darkening in some of those areas things are having a different look to them double check here okay So I still have it set at 25 PSI and I don't think I'm going to get away with 25 PSI with this as opposed to the inks, but that's okay. We'll push it and see how far we can push it. on our other eyebrow so right now we are doing a little bit of a monochromatic here because I want to ease into the eyebrows I don't want to come in all black too early because that would kind of throw things off I don't want to throw things off right and we can start working on our hair a little bit And I'm keeping everything within the same family when I go to the super dark because I don't want to come in and hit black right away. And what better way than to have the same DNA of colors when I'm just slowly establishing those darkest darks. Definitely, it's a lot more finagling, a lot more moving stuff around. It's not simple when you're working in color and there's more hair over here I'll just kind of show that off so we can use this really nice dark and bring that here and kind of work in uh, some of the shadows over here rework in the shadow plane here so we definitely keep working see if it works you know come in with a color like that dark i was using and say hey that works you know and then go with it live with it 
So I did make a freehand stencil uh, or customized stencil. And what are we at? 11.18. So not bad. So what do you guys think of the uh, first color live stream in a very long time? What do you guys think? Do you like? Okay, so I made this with my own little hands. Well, no, I made it with a plotter. I want to get this perfecto. So I don't believe the magnets are going to work with this and I don't want to go through all that trouble. So I'm just going to put something heavy on there. Okay. Well, you don't want to cast shadow, so that's not good. Okay. Let's see how this worked or didn't work. Dun dun dun. Not bad. Look at that. I like it. Uh, it's a little harsh compared to what I was doing, but I got the teeth really nice and everything like that. And I have this. Let me just dull the white of the eye on this side a little bit. Uh, Rick says that he loves it. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. No, I enjoy doing these color live streams. So when was the last one I did? I think it was in 2016 or 2017 was the last one I did. I did uh, color airbrush India ink paintings way back uh, up to around 2018, 2019. And then I just decided to do just working in black and white and teaching black and white. Let's deep in the star here. Right now, now I'm going to start thinking about, you know, maybe coming in with some, some of that uh, titanium white with the orange to start lightening up these areas and pulling out these uh, lights, not the highlights, but the lights. So yeah, you work from light to dark. And then there's a point where you start working from dark to light. Uh, from from light so you work from light to dark and then you work from dark to light and you'll see we're going to cross that bridge next week where we're going to start and I'll show you just like now buffering color really comes from the color pencils where you would and I used to be very good at color pencils back in the day and you would get color like this and then you would mix a white and then you would buffer those colors by doing circular motions and kind of making those transparents more opaque and then you would darken it and repeat the process. So that's pretty much the thinking that I'm doing here. So yeah, I'm an oil painter, but in acrylic I work a little bit different. The way I mix the colors, as you can see, 
is very similar to how I mix colors and oils but the application is definitely its own little application right its own little thing going on so now that I'm here let me go ahead and put the darks in her ear and the corner of her mouth she's really very beautiful Michella okay so that looks pretty good so far and let's see so this is where we are right now not bad for the initial layers of color everything's going pretty well thank god and i'm very happy i thank god for the ability to do the live streams and you know being blessed to have the roof and the equipment and everything uh but you know very happy and thankful that it's coming out okay so far so now that we're looking at this we are going to we're gonna just we're gonna go to the loony bin together I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start lightening up this area and now you can see the way I'm working is I didn't go ahead crazy like say like oh you want to work like the way I do in India inks really thin that's not practical if I went too thin all of this would be very tacky uh, it may be tacky in the initial stages when you first put it down but right now it's very it's it's very smooth and you feel the surface of the original marble dust which is good if I can blow this up and show you that I have the texture I still have the texture of the surface so I didn't get rid of that and that's what I'm counting on right I'm counting on that and so what we're going to do is we're going to clean out this airbrush really quickly remember it's our darkest dark so we have to clean that out thoroughly thoroughly and what we're going to do is we're going to put in now I want to do this only because I want to show you that thinking of using opaque white to kind of uh, you know bring the colors where you want and working from from uh, working from dark to light in airbrush and it is very possible working dark to light I'm actually going to take the needle out of this and also when you're working in uh, acrylics like this or create text whatever it is it does it is harder on your airbrush no doubt about it but one thing you can see is that when I'm working in color it's very fast right do you agree Steve when you're working in color you're kind of going at a much faster speed uh, with your thinking and everything than if you were working monochromatically monochromatic you can take your time and you know just enjoy the ride and, but when you're working in color it's like monochromatic on steroids okay so I'm going to and that's just my own take on it you might feel differently Steve okay so now I'm going to we're going to bring in our titanium white So here is titanium white by golden and it is definitely more of an opaque color so it's going to do more we want right uh, oh see Steve has a great point it feels like juggling it really does like you almost have to like like kind of divide your mind right because you're thinking of color you're thinking of chemical reactions you're thinking of all these different things thinking of your airbrush working correctly right there's so much going on and uh, like you say you're juggling and how I could liken it to is when I used to be a waiter and you had like four tables and everyone had a different drink and everyone had a different entree and appetizer and you had to keep track of that and so it's kind of similar to that 
Okay, so we're going to get, I have my airbrush, my high flow, but let me get my, now where did it go? So I'm looking for my airbrush medium. Okay, here it is. So we're going to thin this out with some airbrush medium one to one. And then we're going to thin that out just a little bit more with our high flow. And we're going to take that same pink brush and we're going to just blend this. So let's say if you're making a smoothie, you might want to, wow, that was almost a disaster. You might, <laughs> and that would have been, that would have been opaque white. So that would have been the kiss of death, guys. There would have been no fixing that one. So nice and thick and opaque, see that? And now we're going to take that pyro red, and we're going to be very judicial with it. Just like there. Pyrrole, transparent tri pyrrole orange. Gonna put a tiny bit more because my instinct tells me it's not quite enough. Now why orange? Because when you have a blue shift, it's gonna be blue. And how you combat that is with its complement. And its complement is this orangey color. Okay, I'm going to thin that out just a little bit, but I'm going to raise my air pressure to around 45. Because now I'm working much more thickly. Not sickly, thickly. Okay, let's... Let's see, but remember, I'm not going to go into my painting because that would be disastrous if it didn't work, right? So let's use our test panel. I'm going to darken this a bit so you can see. Brad, have a good night. Take care, sir. So far it looks like it's not bluing, so I'm going to do a place where I can probably fix it easily. So I'm going to come right here. Oh yeah, see how it's lightening it for me? And I'm actually happy that I am not getting a blue shift, or at least not as much as... So now I'm able to... come in and lighten up her colors here. So when you're doing this, you're actually going against the law of airbrushing, right? You're kind of breaking the rules. Now I can see there's a little blue shift happening there. It's a little darker, so I'm going to hold off on that. Maybe just a little more of the pyro orange here. Maybe a tad bit more water. Now it's more difficult to work with because it's definitely more difficult to work with because it's thicker and um, and it wants the blue shift in the worst way.
Now, I can come over this lighter color with darker color quite easily and just continue going back and forth as if I was working in pastel. But you have to be careful of adding just the right amount of that pyro orange to combat that blue shift. Because that blue shift is going to kick your ass. Now once I establish this lighter color, I can come over it again and get less blue shift every time I go over that color. So I'm going over the 11 or 30 a little bit because I wanted to teach this particular lesson. And breaking rules, who's breaking rules? <laughs> I'm always breaking those artistic rules, my friend. So here I'm doing a super orbital ridge over there. So I'm still with my preconceived tendencies. And now I could work on her hands. Now there is a slight blue shift on the hands, but that's okay because the hands are on the blue side. And what I'm going to do is add just a little more pyro orange here. And I'm going to back mix. Back flush, whatever you call it. Okay. See how I had to add more orange to get to that more saturated area because it wanted to blue shift a lot more. Every time I go over an area, I get less and less blue shift because now it's going over a white area and not an area that has pigment. Okay, so that basically is it for tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, let me make sure that we are in focus. Okay, so you can see how I avoided the blue shift. There is a slight discoloration, but it actually is falling within the colors of the portrait. And you can see when I come in and darken here again, then it's going to clean up. So there is some blue shift in these shadows, but I don't care about that because I can come back into it. It's just the blue shift in the lights I was worrying about. And so I think that's going to work out just fine. And thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. Everyone, thank you so much, Mr. Chris, uh, Brad, and uh, Rick, and everybody, Roy, and Honey for the Super Chat sticker. I really appreciate it. And uh, everyone for hanging out, Pam, and uh, let's see, we had, we had JC, Air Todd, we had, uh, who else? I don't want to miss anybody. We had Oz, which was great, and Raul. So I think I got everyone, guys. Thank you so much. Mr. Braden, all the way from Canada, thank you so much. Take care, guys. Have a great week. Next week, part three, we're going to start working more into color. Take care, guys.